week seven. Somehow it is already week seven. Okay, so uh, start with uh, mix it up. Start with a, a couple announcements, and then and then get to the bird. So week six quiz available on Moodle due 9 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, one of the questions is about um, kind of the stack discipline, the whole uh, apparatus for when we call procedures, when they push things onto the stack, where return values, uh, and so on. Um, and in particular, it asks you to figure out what uh, the stack will look like after a recursive function uh, is called several times. And uh, one thing to take away or to keep in mind going into that is that we can do recursion with the kind of call and return uh, instructions that we've seen. There's nothing extra, nothing special that we need to have for a function to, to be recursive. Uh, other thing, uh, labs four and five, you will have the option to do them uh, with a partner of your choice or to be matched with a partner or to work on them alone. There, I sent out, uh, just sent out before class a survey about that. Please fill that out before class on Wednesday uh, with what you would like to do on those labs. Bird for today, the bald eagle. Uh, Though these birds may look majestic, they just find dead things and eat them. Um, uh, this bald eagle was, was photographed near um, somewhere like a, a cattle farm and there were cows being born and so this eagle probably like flew down and grabbed some uh, placenta or something that had come out of a, a cow uh, to eat. Having, having a meal and then uh, carefully cleaning its beak with its uh, extremely sharp, sharp talons. Uh, you see eagles sometimes, um, you'll uh, catch them with kind of bloody feathers around their beak because they've uh, been eating a roadkill or, or something like that. Um, but they do, they do still look pretty majestic uh, and have a kind of death, death stare. Um, if they if they think you might be food, although the juveniles haven't quite mastered mastered the death stare, uh, just look sort of confused. Uh, all right, what questions do you have about uh, the lab about malloc and free allocators, Jake? I was wondering if we talk about like how you would overwrite a function to do the overflow. I'm wondering if the key is really to just insert a string that's big enough that it would go beyond kind of like the bit size that was allocated for that, so that it then goes into you know, the addresses that we are trying to override, or if there's more to it besides just that input string? Uh, no, that, that is exactly okay. what you're trying to do. The vulnerable, vulnerable program takes in a string, doesn't check how long it is, and so however many bytes worth of string you put in, those bytes will be written to the stack from the start of the buffer to however many you put in. So if you put in enough, you can start overwriting, uh, say, the return address. Um, and you can also put whatever other information you need. If you need a string to be on the stack, if you need there to be code on the stack that then will be executed. You can just put all that in through the input string. So I guess the challenge is then figuring out like how long the string you want to put in, because that would be based on how many bytes you've been writing. Allocates so that's, that's where the disassembly comes in. Yes, you would need to look at the assembly for your particular target to know how big the buffer is. Uh, and then the other piece is going to be using GDB to figure out what addresses you need to put in. So there are certain functions you want to cause to be executed when GitBuff returns, so you need the address of those instructions uh, to cause those to be executed. And then when you're putting stuff on the stack, I guess part of the, your input, you might put code on the stack, you might put a string on the stack, and you'll need to know the address where you put those. But if you know the address of the start of the buffer, you are in control of where then within your input particular things occur, and you can, knowing the start of the buffer, figure out what address based on the start of the buffer, whatever code or, or string you're putting it will be. 
Like, so how do you like control like for phase two and three of the first one? Like, how do you control uh, the return? Like, once you insert some code, like, where the return goes? Like, how do you get the return to go to touch two or to touch three? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we have our return address on the stack, and that's where RSP is. And we hit the return in the git buff function. What is that? What is uh, when we execute a return instruction? What's going to happen? Yeah, so we take what's here, we put it into our instruction pointer. So that's going to say if we've overwritten this to say send us to this exploit code to start executing it. And the important thing is that when we pop it off the stack, we move RSP up to remove this from the stack. So RSP is now here. And so we go through the exploit code, and we get to a return in the exploit code. Where is that return going to get the return address from? Think about the return address. Yeah, it, return always gets whatever it are, is at RSP. So through our buffer over, like, we just need to keep track, where is RSP going to be whenever a return instruction executes? Because if we know where that is, we can ensure that the correct address is at that point. Um, so uh, does that make sense? Yeah, and then RSP like increments by eight there. Yeah, all of our return addresses will be eight bytes, and so when we uh, do a return, RSP will, will go up by eight. John? How, like, in what ways do RSP and RAX interact with returns differently? Uh, retur the return instruction itself has no interaction with RAX. Uh, it's just the case that after a function returns, the code that called it will access the return value in RAX if it indeed uses the return value at all. So within a function, it will put its return value into Rx at some point. It gets the return. That doesn't change Rx at all. That does this, modify RSP, put the, uh, take the return address, put it in the instruction pointer. And then just like when we pass uh, arguments into a function, we use RDI, RSI. There's nothing about the call instruction that does anything with RDI and RSI. Those are set up with instructions before the call happens. So it's like it's more like convention than it is like exactly. functionality. Okay. Yes, it is a convention that Rx will be used for the return value. Other questions? All right. So don't need this for now. Okay, so I'm going, uh, picking up where we left off about uh, uh, allocating memory uh, on the heap. We've looked more in depth at malloc and free. We've looked at the idea of we have blocks of memory that we're allocating on the heap, and it matters kind of where we, where we place them. And we're just returning pointers to those blocks uh, from malloc. And today, we're going to look into what is the allocator actually doing to make malloc and free work. Uh, I came up at the end of, of last class. Uh, there's some sort of metadata that our allocator is keeping track of, uh, or heap data structures. So. Let's talk about what is it that our, our allocator is going to be required to do. Um, our allocator is going to need to 
be able to handle arbitrary request sequences, which means a program is allowed to uh, call malloc for any amounts it wants in any orders, in any order, and free those specific requests in any order, and the allocator should still work. It can't make any assumption, oh, you have to, the thing you allocate first has to be the biggest thing that you ask for. That, it can't assume that. It's a kind of arbitrary sequence of, of mal to requests immediately, which just means the allocator can't say, you know, I'd rather wait to see what the next few requests are before I give you back the pointer that, that you want. No, it has to just, gets a request, has to allocate some chunk and give back a pointer that. It can't postpone it to try and optimize it in some way. We also want our allocator to, as much as possible, in, in practice, this uh, may not be absolute, but as much as possible to use only the heap to maintain whatever additional information in the, it needs to maintain about allocated blocks. And we'll see, uh, in fact, it will use, it will have extra information that kind of goes along with each chunk of memory uh, that's malloc to keep track of uh, the information it needs about that. And that information will just also be on the heap. And finally, our allocator is not allowed to modify allocated blocks. So, for example, our Allocator can say, you know, this block that I allocated earlier is in a really inconvenient place. I would like to move it. Except the user has a pointer to that place. So if we move it, someone gets screwed. And so our, our, once we allocate a block, we just can't do anything with it. It is just fixed. We can't change any of the data there because someone is using that memory, and until they free it, we can't touch it. Questions on these requirements? All right, so this is what our allocator has to do. Let's talk about what we would like our allocator to do. What are our goals? We would like our allocator to maximize throughput, and this is measured in requests per second. So how many calls to malloc and free can our allocator process, can it return from per second? And we'd want it to be able to get through as many as possible. So we want it to be fast. <laughs> We also want to maximize memory utilization. this as the percentage of the total heap space that is allocated. So as a, um, as a sort of illustrated example, we could write a very fast allocator that every time a request to malloc comes in, we call that sbreak function to just add more space to the heap. And every time the request comes in, we just add a thousand bytes to the heap and return a point for that. 
Because, you know, who doesn't want extra space? So lots of requests per second, terrible utilization. Because we end up with all this kind of, all these, all these big empty chunks of memory on the heap. So our heap is, is taking up a lot more bytes than it actually needs. So kind of our, our utilization, how efficiently we are using the available memory would be very poor. So we want to process requests very fast and we want to process them in such a way that they use the heap space as efficiently as possible. <coughs> Would these two goals be, I guess, compatible? Like increasing throughput also is going to increase memory utilization, or would they be in tension? Would it be? Uh, would there be a trade-off involved? John, definitely a trade-off, I'd say. Why? Why might there be a trade-off? Um, because the more you maximize utilization, uh, the more tightly you're going to have to pack all of your memory together, and the more you're going to have to be like slotting memory into very like specific spaces to maximize like unused memory. So the more work you're going to have to do to like figure out all that slotting, which reduces the throughput. Yeah, we have. Finding these most efficient choices memory-wise is going to take time, which is the opposite of improving throughput. Is that what you were thinking, Sam? Yeah. Yeah, so we do have a tension between these, and so in designing our allocator, we're going to have to make trade-offs in terms of we can make it faster, but <coughs> we'll use memory a little less efficiency. Efficiently, or we can make optimal memory utilization choices, but it's going to be slower because we're doing a lot of searching through the heap to find the best spot to put something. Luisa, can we decide what to do in the lab, or is it just like do this? Uh, and in, in the lab, indeed, you will be both of these things will be measured by your allocator, and you will have the freedom to make different design choices. All right, take a minute and think about which of these statements is false. All right, please discuss with your neighbors why you think the statement you chose is false. All right, we have a, uh, a correct majority in this case. Uh, I, D is, is the one of these that will be false. Uh, someone share with us why why that's not true. Lisa? Because if there's no space or something, the model can return zero, and then it's like the word that information. Exactly. As we have seen uh, in lab zero, Malik could return null, but it didn't stop the program. It just, you know, the function returned, and then you might, uh, it would stop your program if you tried to use that as a memory address. But uh, you could certainly approach it in a way that, that would, uh, would not, would avoid a crash in that case. Uh, questions on, on any of these answers? Oh. What does the allocation failure happen? Like, what situation will that happen? Uh, so, if there's not enough space on the heap to meet your request, and then the allocator calls sbreak to add more space to the heap, and that function's return value indicates that it couldn't add more space to the heap, for example, uh, the system, all the, the memory is being used to the operating system doesn't allow the heap space to increase, then Malik would need to return null saying, I couldn't, couldn't meet this request. Uh, so that might happen if there's high memory use, or if uh, a malloc request came in for just a, a stupidly huge value. You know? Um, so on the blackboard, it says like find most 
efficient choices? Like, how does a computer know what is the most efficient choice? So, the question is, well, how do we know what the most efficient choice is? And so we're uh, efficient in terms of this memory utilization. And the thing that makes us less efficient in using memory is fragmentation. So either internal fragmentation or external fragmentation. So efficient choices would be those that reduce or minimize the amount of fragmentation. So internal fragmentation, for example, is when we have extra space that's part of a block that was not requested. So uh, to minimize that, we might go through and try and find the, an amount of empty space that fits the size of the request perfectly, so that there's no, uh, there's no internal fragmentation and kind of adding some extra space to that. Um, we're trying to reduce external fragmentation. Uh, we may want to avoid, um, uh, like there might be uh, simple things we could do trying to alloc uh, allocate blocks that are next to already allocated blocks. So they sort of fill in empty spaces. Uh, we might be trying to do something really uh, fancy where we have some estimate of what future requests might come in, and so we're, we're optimizing based on some prediction. Uh, but yes, it, efficient choices just means reducing fragmentation. Sean? Okay, I'm still having an issue with understanding how the is involved, like in the demonstration last week, I think we're looking at internal and external fragmentation, uh, looking at how it skips over and you know, we recognized what in the demonstration, you know, we recognized there wasn't enough space there. And so like, how would, I would have thought that would be like empty and sort of arbitrary. Um, and yeah, how would one would recognize that? So it's not necessarily empty because some other program could have used that memory before and then freed it and whatever data that program put there is still in those bytes. So just because it's not currently used doesn't mean it wasn't used in the past. So it could be empty if it was never used, but we can't assume that. We don't have any record of whether a particular chunk of memory was malloced uh, in the past. So it might have old data there, which is why it's arbitrary. We can't assume anything about what data is there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you call free, it doesn't like turn everything into zeros. It just like says this is not being used anymore. Exactly. Okay. I thought when we talked about internal fragmentation, it was like and uh, allocating a bit more space to take it aligned to these sixteen byte chunks, right? So how could you reduce internal fragmentation if you don't always need to go to a sixteen byte chunk the better where you put it? So there were a few different sources of. Uh, internal fragmentation. Uh, there was the placement policy, which we'll talk about today, the padding for alignment purposes, which is what uh, Elliot is talking about, and memory used to maintain heap data structures, which we're also talking about today. So I agree that when we're aligning to 16 bytes, that we're just going to have to do. Uh, but these other how we place things and how much memory we use to keep track of extra information, there are design decisions to be made there. Other questions? Christian? Can you still use a pointer after you free it? Like, we free the memory, but assuming I haven't messed with the heap at all, I haven't malleted anything else, so there's no way the space would have been given to something else. I can theoretically still use a pointer to that memory, right? Using a pointer that has been freed. It would be good behavior, good practice, but I could, right? Uh, it has undefined behavior. So, might work fine, as you're saying, might still be there. Uh, it might be, it might now lie outside the regions of memory your program is allowed to access, so it might result in a segmentation fault, or the data there might have been changed or allocated to some other program, um, uh, and who knows what you might find. So, no, there's nothing, uh, a program that accesses a memory address after freeing it will compile, can be run, 
has undefined behavior. Okay. Other questions? All right, I want to make sure to get, um, well, actually, no. Let us, let's do a bit more practice. So here's a situation where we have the heap starting at address hex 1000, saying the heap is empty as in nothing. There's not currently any blocks allocated on the heap. So it's all free. And our break pointer, thing that keeps track of the, the top of the heap, that's at hex uh, 1100. And then we have a sequence of requests, malloc 18, malloc 24, malloc 10, malloc 32, malloc 33. So for each request, I would like you to work with your neighbors to determine the uh, size of the block that will be allocated and the address that will be returned to the user, to the, uh, to the caller of Malik. So we know where the heap starts. We know what sizes come in, uh, so take a few minutes working with your, your neighbors to fill in that table. Let's talk through these. So for malloc of, of 18, uh, we need to have a have 16 byte aligned blocks on our heap. Uh, so what size of block are we going to to allocate for this. I'll give it 32 bytes. That's the only generous. <laughs> yeah, so we have to, to round up to the nearest multiple of 16 in order to, to maintain that, that alignment. Uh, what address is going to be the start, start of our block here? Hex uh, 1000. Exactly. We have the block is at the beginning of our heap. We return a pointer to the beginning of the block. So we have address 1000 there. All right, let's keep going. Malik 24. What? That's 32. And what address is that going to be at? Okay. And why 1020? Because it's going to start at the end of the previous like space allocated, which was 32 bytes long. Yeah, exactly. 32 bytes and hex is 20. So 20 bytes after the start of this one will be the start of the next one. Uh, how about our, our malloc 10, Jade? Uh, 16. 16. Now take us the address of 1040 because we in the previous one had to allocate 32, and so that would take us 20. Mm -hmm. stuff. Exactly right. Uh, Malik, our Malik 32, how big is that one going to be? 32. No rounding required. Someone else give us the address that that block will be at. Aiden? Text 1050. 1050, adding our 16 or hex 10. And lastly, our malloc 33. John? Uh, 48. And rounding up to the nearest multiple of 16. And someone else give us what address is our, our final block here going to be at? Chris? Uh, and did we have enough space on the heap? Did we need to call S break at any time? Right, that if we're going to go 48 bytes past 1070, where this one starts, 48 is hex 30, so we go all the way up to address 1100, and we did never need to add more space to the heap in order for all of these to, to fit. 
Um, 10A0, 9, 1100, good catch. Then we add 3 to 7, and that's A and X, not, not 10. Any questions on, on the, this uh, uh, allocator simulation? All right, so let's make this uh, um, picture more complicated. Let's talk about what are the implementation choices we actually have to make. So we have to decide when we call free, all the user gives us is a pointer. When they call malloc, they give us a number of bytes that they wanted. And we give them back a pointer, and then when they go to free that, we just get this pointer. So one implementation question is when we're freeing, how much memory on the heap do we free and how do we know uh, what that is? Another question is the free block organization. How do we know which blocks which bytes of the heap are free and which are allocated. We have to have some way of, of organizing that information. We have the question of the placement policy, which is Assuming we have some free block or organization, we have the ability to tell which blocks are free, we then need to decide which free block to use. Or another way to think of that is where to place the newly allocated block, where to place the memory that we're about to hand back uh, from a malloc call. Something that follows on from our placement policy is if we're going to place a block, let's say we have uh, uh, 256 free bytes and our request is for 48. What do we do with that extra space in the free block? Do we split? Do we split them up? Do we just allocate the whole thing? How do we split them up? That's this, this splitting piece. And finally, we have coalescing. integrating it or putting it back into, into, the, into the heap. Let's say once we allocate something that's 48 bytes, does it remain this distinct 48 byte chunk forever? Or do we have some way that it might get combined with other free space? So one key way of addressing a number of these questions how much to free, how do we know what's free, and that will impact the other choices as well.
is a design called an implicit free list. That the basic idea is that we're going to have a linked list of free blocks. But we're not going to actually have next and previous pointers the way that we implemented a linked list in lab zero. These pointers are going to be implicit as part of the data that we are keeping around in the list. And the way that this will work is that an allocated block up until now, I've been kind of drawing as an undifferentiated kind of block of memory that's a certain size. But we're going to, in fact, maintain a header. <coughs> this, ex, this is that extra heap metadata that's part of every allocated block. So our heap blocks are going to be made up of a header, the payload, which is the allocated, the, the, the chunk of memory that the user is actually putting stuff in. So this is, someone calls Malik, this payload is the, is the part that they are actually using. And then there's potential padding to round it up to a multiple of 16, the way that we were doing here. And then this header. And this header is going to consist of the block size, and then four, four bits here. So this header is going to be eight bytes total. And what do we know about the size of blocks on our heap? They're going to be multiples of 16. And if I write down, we can just look at these. These are all multiples of 16. For these, for an address to be a multi multiple of 16, could it ever have anything besides zero in this least significant digit? No. So this size is always a multiple of 16. We know that the lowest four bits are always zero for a number that's a multiple of 16. That if it had uh, a one or a three or whatever in, in these lower four bits, it would not be a multiple of 16, which means if we want to keep track of both the size and whether this is whether this block is allocated or free, we can just reserve the least significant bit. It will be a 1 if this block is allocated, and it will be a 0 if this block is free. So. Several weeks ago, someone asked, when would we ever use this, like, packing bits together and needing to pull them apart in practice when we were talking about bitwise operators? This is one of those times. We have one bit of information, and then we have a size. And we can avoid having to reserve some entire additional eight bytes or, or some other section of our block for our one bit allocated or free by combining it with the size because we know the size least significant bits will be zero since it will be a multiple of 16. <laughs> Questions on this picture uh, before I go into an example? Why did you represent that as a slash f? Uh, so I put a slash f because it's either, this bit is either going to be a one when it's allocated or zero when it's free. So I did a slash f because this bit indicates indicates allocated or free. But oh, its value will be like one oh, or zero. Sorry, I was thinking hex. Ah, uh, yes, I, I agree that it's confusing. This is a single bit, so it's just one or a zero, 
and it's significantly allocated to free job So, which way does the causation flow here? Like, is the reason is part of the reason we have to keep everything sixteen bit aligned because we get to use that last bit nicely with the allocated versus free? Uh, even if it was eight byte aligned, the lowest three bits would be zero. Um, so it's 16 byte aligned uh, because the user may have 16 byte <laughs> quantities, the kind of extra large integers that we, or, or floats that we can have in 64 bit. Uh, and so 32 bit program uh, allocators will be 8 byte aligned, 64 bit allocators will be 16 byte aligned. Right. Is it also 16 byte aligned because like the first byte in block? Yes, this is uh, this is an important point that as there is kind of a combination of we need these things to be aligned, and then we also have this eight byte header <laughs> means that uh, uh, that determines kind of what is our minimum block size, and so. In this world, we can have at a minimum a one byte, uh, eight bytes of size and eight bytes of halo, which gives our, our block a multiple, to be a multiple of 16. But as well, we're going to introduce something later that will, uh, another piece of metadata will be useful that is going to again change our kind of minimum block size. Okay. So if you were to mount up a, like an item that is of size 16, then it will be a 32 size block because of that you have to include that. Yes. So this was a kind of simplified picture where we were thinking for for a request of this size, we were basically just writing down the size of the payload when we were doing this exercise. And the address and thinking just in terms of the address of the payload, because the other part of this picture is <laughs> that the pointer that Malik returns is the start of the payload because this is the part of memory we want the, um, uh, that, that the user can actually write to. If we gave them a pointer back to the start of the block, then they overwrite our size and then we are sad. Here. Why don't we have to add a byte to DHRS when we did all the malics to account for the header? Uh, because we did this practice before I was talking about the header. This was a kind of simplified version of the allocator when we weren't thinking about, well, how is it, how are we answering this question? So yes, in reality, we would need to account for the size of the header. Okay. So items in the payload will it also be looking at the last bit to determine if it's allocated versus free, or is that specifically with the header? So the payload is used, so, <laughs> so someone calls malloc, right. we give them back a pointer to the payload, they frolic in this memory, and then they call free on this pointer. And at that point, the allocator would change this bit from one to zero. And in particular, when we ask what is free on our heap, we, we will be looking at these bits to be like, is this block free or is it already used? So for every time we call malloc, it has an individual header. Yes, every kind of chunk on our, on our heap has an individual header. Uh, and I think it would be, be useful to kind of look at this in, in spreadsheet form. So, uh, there are a few things uh, going on here. Uh, the first is there's these specific blocks called prolog and epilog, which will put at the start and end of our heap. And these serve to mark the, the kind of boundaries of the heap. And this prolog and epilog will always be allocated. <laughs> And so we have our request for Q come in. It wants eight bytes. And we'll search through and find uh, the, uh, the first empty, empty spot. Uh, and we'll say, OK, this total size of this block will be 16. And we'll color it yellow. And then this byte here 
is this is the address we will return from this malloc call, the start of the payload. <coughs> and you may be wondering, what is this kind of blank spot here? It is an unused eight bytes on the heap, so that this queue, the payload of our first block, is 16 bytes aligned. That if we had this 16 byte prologue, and then our 16 byte allocated block, Q would end up as a, at a multiple of eight, but not of 16. So we have this kind of eight byte offset uh, to make the alignment work out. And uh, we then have R equals malloc 40. So we say, we can give you, give you 40 bytes. And the total block size is going to be 48, because 8 bytes for the header, 40 bytes for the payload. So I can mark out those 48 bytes, and R will be a pointer at the address of the start of this 40-byte payload. So we care about the total size of the blocks being a multiple of 16. So, if the, uh, so we didn't need to round uh, the size of the payload up to a multiple of 16, because with the eight bytes uh, of the header, that works out. Eric? Why would the pointer at the second block? Because if I, gave back, I, if I gave the user a pointer to the start of the block, then if they wrote to the, those bytes, they'd overwrite the size. So when you do malloc 8, and you have to round up to 16, that's actually, you know, Yes, so the thing that we're rounding up to a multiple of 16 is our total block size. So we take size of the request plus the size of any overhead, these headers or, and maybe other things, and that whole thing needs to be a multiple of 16. And then padding is the getting it to multiple of 16. Yeah, if, uh, if we have to add extra space to get it to a multiple of 16, we do that at the end. Sam. Wait, sorry, the, the pointer is supposed to be multiple of 16 or the start of the, um, the start of the block? Uh, the address we return to the user needs to be a multiple of 16. <laughs> yeah, so this Q and, and R, the address we're returning from now. Okay. So if I wanted and I malloc something and I could like, like <laughs> say that Q equals malloc 8, I could do something like Q minus 1 dereferenced and then that's with the size now that it's like gone backwards, right? Absolutely. So I'm arming you with dangerous knowledge to uh, deliberately overwrite heap data structures and cause uh, heap corruption errors when you go to free that memory. Uh, so speaking of freeing memory, let me uh, uh, get to the point where we're actually freeing something. So S, we again need 16. Uh, we return at this pointer s, and then, uh, so this is the setup of the heap when we get to this free r. So this question, how much to free? The user passes in r, and we know that's the start of a payload, and so we know if we look eight bytes before that, we're going to find the size, and we're going to find the header of, of the, the block. And so we change that header from allocated to free. R is now invalid. This is now uh, free. But it still has the size 48 in this byte because we didn't, we, the block is still 48 bytes. It's now just free. Same, there would also be a header here to say, here's a block of 48 bytes that's free. <laughs> so would that get aside? So uh, I skipped over one uh, one thing, which is at the start, as I was going through this, at the start this would all have been one block. So the actual picture at the start would have been, let's see, 48, 96, uh, 104, 112, 120, 128. So this would it be an entire like 128 bytes of, of free space. And then we allocate 16. So we split it into our 16 byte block and our 
uh, 112 byte free space. Then we allocated 48, so this was 48, uh, and this was uh, 48 plus 16, which is 72. Then we allocated 16 of that, and the leftover was, was 48. So we start with one big free chunk, and then we start splitting it up, and that's this, this splitting piece. But when we have one huge uh, chunk, how do we split it up? Where within that chunk are we, are we placing our, our allocated block? So we have this picture here, and we have p equals malloc 24. And how do we go through our heap to find a block that fits? We don't have any sort of next uh, pointer here that we can follow. Uh, but I told you that this was an implicit linked list. And that's because the size of the block tells us where to find the next block. So we started our prologue, and we say, okay, this is an allocated block, and it says it's 16, so if I go 16 bytes forward, I'm going to find the header of the next block. This, again, is a header that says it's allocated. It says it's 16 bytes, so I'll go another 16 bytes forward, and look at this block. Okay, here's a block that's 48. That's both big enough for my request and it's free. And so I have found a block that can, can meet this malloc 24. And so that's what makes this an implicit list. It's that the sizes are implicitly a pointer to how many bytes forward, forward we need to go to find the next block in the heap. So it's as if each of these were a pointer to the start, uh, to the header of the next block as we go through. Does that make sense? Questions on this kind of using the header to, to go through the heap? Nina? Yeah. So would they track in its, like, unless you have a free comment, or they would also track in, they will also check the size when you're assigning key awareness? So we, we, you're saying we have a malloc call, and as it's going through, is it checking just allocated or free, or also the size? Um, like, so as you said, like when we're allocating the key, it needs to check the size. Mm -hmm. um, but like when we're, if we don't have the, like, um, when we're allocating Q, R, and S, will it also check the available size? Or, or it's just like going over? Like, does it start seeing the beginning as well, like, to check the size? Or uh, it just, like, adds up to the end of the memory because there is no, like, free comment? Uh, so, it will, it will go through the blocks using the size to get to the next one, check if the block is free. If it isn't free, then it, we can't use it to meet some request. But if it is free, then we also would check, is it big enough? Can we actually put our, our a payload of 24 bytes in it? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could just ask you after this. All right. Uh, so we found this block, 48 bytes. So uh, if we have an 8 byte, uh, 8 bytes of header and 24 bytes of payload, that gives us a total of 32. And so I'll go ahead and split up this block such that, okay, we now have 32 that we have allocated and we return a pointer to the start of the payload, that's P, and then we need to put another, uh, another header here. Oh, I see. to record that this, uh, that we now have a new free block that is 16 bytes in total size. So when we come into free P, we get this, this pointer uh, P. We know eight bytes before that is the header, 
and we just mark that header from allocated uh, to free. So in this case, we are now in this kind of coalescing question. Because as I have it up here, we have what, what I would call false fragmentation. That is, our heap says we have a 32-byte block and a 16-byte block, but that's a lie. We actually have a contiguous 48-byte block of free space. <laughs> and so we'll want to, whenever we free a block, we'll want to check, are its neighbors free? If so, we want to combine them into a single larger block. Because if we have this request for 40 come in in this situation, we look through and we identify this 48 as the only one that's big enough to meet our request for 40, when in fact there was enough free space here, we just had it too fragmented, had it broken up into these smaller free blocks. So we want to combine these. So I'd like you to take a minute and talk with your neighbors, brainstorm, what would we need to change in this picture to do this like combining step, to have our heap view these as kind of one, one larger block. All right, what, uh, what ideas came up in your, in your brainstorm? I'm pretty sure the one thing you have to do is just change the header of the first block, the 32, to just be equal to the sum of the size of the two blocks. And that's all you have to do, I think. Yeah, that, that, that will do it. If we have this pointer P here, how do we check or, or get information about the next, the next block? It's P plus 32. Yeah, that we we can go one word, one eight byte chunk back from P, and that size tells us where to look in the next block. If that's free, good news, we can combine these. And as Christian suggested, we just add the two sizes together, and now we have one free block of, of 48. <laughs> Jay? Well, what, so the reason why we could do this is because we just read something that was like quote unquote on the left. And the next thing that was also free was on the right. But what if it was the other way around? How do you know like how far to go back to to get to that other block memory? So we could, uh, if we had uh, a pointer to the 16, we could start at the beginning of the heap and go through all the blocks until we find the one we're at. And oh, it's the one that we got to before that. Uh, that's going to be slow. Right. Uh, so we'd like to do better, and we can do better by adding not only uh, a header, but a footer that is exactly the same as the header. So we have a size, and we have our least significant bit, one or zero, for allocated or free. And now, if we're at the head, if we're at the header of one block, we go eight bytes back, and that's the footer of the previous block. And so we can use that to traverse backwards through the list. John. Doesn't this then mean that like we have to also have the space for that footer in every one of these blocks? So now we have like two blocks of eight bytes instead of one. Exactly. This changes our minimum block size. That if we need 16 bytes for our header and footer, and our payload has to be 16 byte aligned, our payload has to be at least 16 and also a multiple of 16 in size. So our minimum block is now 32 bytes. So the once we add these header and footer, which are called Boundary tags, or because they indicate the boundaries of a block, once we add these two, we will have minimum 32 bytes in, in each block. Eric? When we combine the 16 and the 32, we need to switch a bit of that size to the unallocated 
Uh, so do we need to change anything about this 16 header? It was already free. Um, that's how we knew we could combine it. So uh, we, in fact, don't need to change this 16 uh, at all. It can just stay there. And this is another reason why there may be arbitrary data in the bytes you get back from malloc, because old headers may just be sitting in the middle of, of the block you get back from one of these previous merging steps. Uh, Sam. Uh, so in this, uh, it, 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 it wouldn't because this 48 block would have a footer that says it's 48 bytes. So we'll look more at this uh, next time, uh, but we're out of time for today. Uh, quiz due Tuesday night, uh, lab three due Wednesday night. Please fill out the partner survey for the next labs. Uh, I have office hours uh, tomorrow night, and I'll see you Wednesday. Thank you. Mm -hmm.